Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this lecture on body fluid compartments, we will learn the following. We will learn what are the various body fluid compartments and how we can classify them. We will also learn what are the composition, what is the composition of these different body fluid compartments and we will learn what are the principles of measuring these various body fluid compartments and what is the significance of this. Now, we know that the earth is covered by around 71 percent of water. So, a large proportion or a majority of the proportion of the earth is actually covered by water and land occupies only a small percentage or a minimal percentage of the earth's surface. A similar comparison can be made for our body, where if you look at the composition of the human body, we realize that the human body is about 60 percent water or 60 percent of the weight of our bodies is water and the remaining uh, material like proteins, fats and minerals occupy only about 40 percent of body weight. Now the 60 percent of body water is not an absolute value and there are many variations of this percentage. This 60 percent of body water depends also on the percentage of fat. Fat is relatively free of water and so the greater the proportion of fat, the lower will be the proportion of body water. So women also have a lower proportion of body water and that is attributed to a larger proportion of subcutaneous fat. As a person increases with age, the proportion of body water also decreases. So these are some changes that are seen with in body water with age uh, depending on the sex of the individual and also depending on the amount of body fat. Now since we are talking about body fat, there is a term that we need to discuss and that term is called lean body mass and lean body mass is the mass of a person without fat. So we take the total weight of a person and calculate the fat content and the weight of a person or the mass of a person without that fat is called the fat free mass or the lean body mass. And if you look at the water content of a person, uh, a person's lean body mass, that will be 70 ml per 100 grams of lean body mass or that is 70 percent of the lean body mass. And one thing to remember is as the fat percentage increases, the proportion of body water decreases. Now where is this water present? We said 60 percent of the body is water. Where is this water present? So in this figure you can see cells, you can see the fluid that is just around the cells. This is a capillary having the RBCs within it. This is the capillary endothelium. So one easy way of dividing the body water is to divide it into the water that is inside the cells and the water that is outside the cells. So the water that is inside the cells is called the intracellular fluid and the water that is outside the cells is called the extracellular fluid. And now you can make out that there is an extracellular fluid that is just around the cells and this fluid that is around the cells is called the interstitial fluid. And the fluid, the part of the extracellular fluid that is inside the, the blood vessels or the fluid part of blood is called plasma. So if we were to classify body fluids, we could classify them into the intracellular fluid which is within the cells and the extracellular fluid which is outside the cells and the extracellular fluid is divided into two compartments. One is the interstitial fluid which is the fluid outside the cells and plasma which is the fluid portion of blood. Let us look at the proportions. We said total body water is 60 percent of body weight. The intracellular fluid is actually two-thirds of this. So 40 percent of the body weight is the intracellular fluid 
and 20 percent of the body weight is the extracellular fluid. So, there is more fluid within the cells than outside the cells. Out of this plasma is 5 percent of body weight and the interstitial fluid is about 15 percent of body weight. Let us look at how does this translate into absolute numbers. So, if you have a 70 kilo adult man, 42 liters would be the total body water, 28 liters will be in his interstitial fluid, 14 liters in the uh, 28 liters in the intracellular fluid, 14 liters in the extracellular fluid, plasma will contain about 3.5 liters and the interstitial fluid will contain about 10.5 liters. There is also something called transcellular fluids. Now, these are fluids that are present in different body spaces, such as the synovial fluid in the joint spaces, the cerebrospinal fluid, which is there in the ventricles, the fluids within the eye, that is the intraocular fluid, the fluid in the peritoneal cavity, the fluid in the pleural space, the fluid in the pericardial space. So, all these are small amounts of fluid that are present in the small different cavities in the body and a collective name given to all these fluids is transcellular fluid. The total value of transcellular fluid in an adult male is only about 1 to 2 liters or it is about 2 to 2.5 percent of the body weight. Our body maintains a balance of water intake and water output. So, if we look at the different ways in which we are able to take water into the body, primarily we take water in the form of fluids and also through the various foods that we take in. A certain amount of water is also produced due to the different metabolic activities within the body. So, these are the ways in which we get water into the system and the water that we take into the GI system finally gets absorbed and reaches the plasma and this is circulated to the different parts of the body and from plasma this water moves into the interstitial space which just surrounds the cells and from this interstitial space it could move into the intracellular fluid. So, this is the way by which water that we take can actually move to the plasma to the interstitial fluid and finally to the fluid that is within the cells. Similarly, if water has to be excreted this water output happens primarily through the kidney in the form of urine. Also during feces there is water excretion. When we breathe out, uh, we breathe out water vapor and so there is water loss due, due to breathing out and also through the sweat uh, from our body there is a lot of water loss. So, these are the ways in which we take water into, the, into our system and the ways in which we uh, remove water from the body and these are the ways in which the different body fluid compartments interact with one another. At this point we can also introduce the term hematocrit. Hematocrit is also called the packed cell volume and how do we get the hematocrit? We take whole blood and if we centrifuge it at a high uh, RPM the RBCs will settle down and above the RBCs you will see the Buffy coat which will contain the WBCs or the white blood cells and the platelets, but that is a very small uh, volume. So, this volume of red blood cells is called the hematocrit or it is the percentage of blood volume that is occupied by the RBCs. This is about 40 to 54 percent for men and a little lower for women that is about 36 to 47 percent for women. The intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid are not similar in composition. If you look at the extracellular fluid, you will realize that it is predominantly a sodium and a chloride based fluid. So, the extracellular fluid is very similar to seawater. Whereas, if you look at the intracellular fluid, the predominant cation in the ICF is potassium. So, potassium is 150 millimolar, whereas in the extracellular fluid it is sodium that is the predominant cation. Now, we should ask ourselves some questions. First of all, how is it that the cell is able to keep the intracellular fluid so different from the extracellular fluid? And the second thing we should ask is, what is the use of keeping the ICF different from the ECF? Now, to address the first question, how does the cell keep the ICF different? That is predominantly by the sodium potassium ATPase. 
the sodium potassium ATPase is an example of primary active transport. And what this protein does is it constantly keeps pushing out sodium from the ICF, therefore keeping the levels of sodium low and it constantly keeps bringing in potassium which therefore keeps the ICF levels of potassium high. So sodium potassium ATPase by using ATP pushes out three sodium ions and brings in two potassium ions. So thereby the sodium potassium ATPase keeps the levels of potassium high and the levels of sodium low within the ICF. The second thing to realize is that there is energy present in this concentration gradient. So there is more sodium in the ECF and there is less sodium in the ICF. So sodium has a tendency to diffuse from the ECF to the ICF. And the cell at various times is able to utilize the energy that is present in this concentration gradient. And therefore when sodium enters into the cell, it is also able to pull another substance with it or maybe take another substance out in a form of a symport or an antiport. And this is an example of secondary active transport. So the cell is able to utilize the energy that is present in a particular concentration gradient to transport other substances in secondary active transport. The other place where the cell is able to utilize these concentration gradients is for cellular communication especially in regards to action potentials. In the neuron as well as in the skeletal muscle, the depolarization of the action potential is due to the entry of sodium. So there is already a concentration gradient that is prepared or maintained by the cell for sodium. So when the membrane permits sodium entry in these uh, cells like the neuron and in the skeletal muscle, when sodium enters the cell, there is a depolarization. Similarly, when potassium exits the cell, there is a repolarization. So the cell is able to generate these action potentials, the depolarization and the repolarization because it keeps a concentration gradient for sodium, potassium as well as for calcium. So the cell spends a large proportion of its energy to maintain these concentration gradients and these concentration gradients are very useful for the cell because they help the cell in cellular transport as well as they help the cell in action potentials and in communication. Now let us look at how we can measure these different body fluid spaces and the way this is done is by the indicator dilution technique or we take a certain amount of a dye and we dilute it within that body space, measure it and see what is the final concentration. And this is based on the law of conservation of mass. So what is it that we do? We take an initial concentration of the dye. Let us say that we have an initial volume and an initial concentration V1 and C1. So the initial mass will be V1 into C1 which will be our initial mass. Then let us say that we add this amount into the body and this volume goes into the body and this volume gets diluted within this entire space. If we take a concentration from here and label that as C2, the total mass which is the same will be V2. Uh, into C2. So we can equate the initial mass with the final mass and say V1 into C1 is equal to V2 into C2 or if we know the mass, we can say the mass is equal to V2 into C2. So all we need to do is find out what is the initial mass diluted within this body space, take a sample from it and then we are able to calculate what is this volume that this mass has been distributed in. And this volume is sometimes called the volume of distribution for that particular compound. Now if we have to use a particular compound or a particular dye, there are certain criteria. Obviously the dye has to be non-toxic, the dye must be easily measurable, we must have some easy way by which we can sample and uh, measure the amount of dye. When we put in the dye, it should not affect the distribution of body water in the body fluid compartment, it must evenly distribute throughout the entire compartment. It should remain in that compartment and either it should not be metabolized or if it is metabolized, the amount of metabolized or the amount metabolized or the amount excreted must be known. So these are some of the criteria if we have to use a particular compound or a particular dye for measuring body fluid spaces. Now this tabular column 
describes the various compounds that are used to measure the different body spaces. Let us take a look at them. If we want to measure the total body water, we have to identify some compound that will pass into all the water that is there in the body. So, compounds that are used for that are tritium oxide, deuterium oxide or heavy water, aminopyrene or antipyrene. So, these are substances whose volume of distribution is the total body water. If we want to measure only the extracellular space or the extracellular fluid, we can use substances like inulin, mannitol or sucrose. Inulin is a polysaccharide and these substances should remain within the ECF compartment and they should not cross into the cells. So, substances such as inulin, mannitol and sucrose can be used to measure the extracellular fluid compartment. Now, what about the intracellular fluid compartment? If we want to measure the intracellular fluid compartment, this cannot be done directly. But what we can do is we can measure the total body water and we can subtract the ECF and total body water minus the ECF will give us an indirect measure of the intracellular compartment. Now, if we want to measure only the plasma volume, we could use albumin which is labeled with radioactive iodine or we could use a substance called Evans blue or T1824 which binds to plasma proteins. So, these remain within the vascular compartment and therefore, we can measure plasma volume. If we want to measure the interstitial fluid volume or the volume that is just around the cells, once again this cannot be measured directly, but we could measure the total ECF volume and subtract the plasma volume. So, ECF volume minus the plasma volume will give us an indirect idea of how much the interstitial volume is. Now, how do we get blood volume? If we know the plasma volume already and we know the hematocrit, we can use the formula plasma volume by 1 minus hematocrit will give us the blood volume or we could also use RBCs which are tagged with radioactive chromium and find the total blood volume. So, this tabular column describes the various uh, compounds that are used to measure the different body fluid spaces. This is a list of the commonly used intravenous fluids. So, very commonly we use normal saline. So, what is normal saline? It is 0.9 gram percent of sodium chloride. So, the solution just contains 0.9 percent sodium chloride and it has an osmolarity that is very similar to the osmolarity of plasma. 5 percent dextrose is a solution that contains only dextrose. We could have ringolactate which contains many other electrolytes. We could also have DNS or dextrose normal saline which contains a mixture of dextrose as well as normal saline. In case we want to replace the entire electrolytes, we could use a multi electrolyte solution such as the commercially available isolite P or ivulite P. Sometimes we would need uh, substances which are plasma expanders or, or IV fluids that remain within the uh, intravascular compartment and improve the plasma volume. So, then we would use plasma expanders. So, this is a, a simple list of the various commonly used IV fluids and as you go to clinics, you will learn more about them. Let us now try to solve a few problems to help us get a little deeper understanding about the various body fluids. So, in this problem, the plasma volume of a person is 3600 ml. Calculate his total blood volume and red cell volume assuming his hematocrit is 40 percent. So, let us begin solving this problem. We are already given that the plasma volume is 3600 ml and the hematocrit is 40 percent or 40 percent of the blood is occupied by the RBCs. So, we know that the plasma volume is equal to the blood volume minus the RBC volume or plasma is blood minus the RBCs. Now, we are ignoring the volume that is occupied by the WBCs and the platelets because that is negligible. Now, that is equal to the blood volume. Now, this RBC volume is we know that 40 percent 
of the blood volume is RBC volume. So we are going to say that this RBC volume is the hematocrit into blood volume. This is the same as the RBC volume. So now we will simplify that, that is equal to blood volume into 1 minus hematocrit. So therefore we get the uh, equation blood volume is equal to plasma volume and I am bringing this down divided by 1 minus hematocrit. And this is the equation that was mentioned in the tabular column when we talked about measurement of blood volume and we said that you could either do it directly or you could do it indirectly by measuring plasma volume and if you know the hematocrit. So now let us substitute what we already know. We know that the plasma volume is 3600 ml. Now when we take this 1 minus hematocrit, we have to convert the hematocrit out of 1. So this is 40 percent or 0.4 out of 1. So this is 1 minus 0 0.4 that is equal to 3600 ml divided by 0 0.6 that is equal to 6000 ml or 6 liters. So we have our blood volume is equal to 6 liters. What is the RBC volume? We know that the hematocrit of 40 percent of this is the RBC volume. So 40 percent, so the RBC volume is equal to 40 percent of blood volume that is equal to 40 divided by 100 into 6000 ml. Okay, so if you cancel you will finally get 2400 ml or 2.4 liters. Sorry, this is the uh, RBC volume. So that is the answer to our problem. We have found that the blood volume is 6 liters and the RBC volume is 2.4 liters. So this is the way in which you can calculate blood volume given plasma volume and the hematocrit. Now there is a little more intuitive way of understanding or solving this problem. We know that plasma volume is 3600 ml and we know that the hematocrit is 40 percent. Now if the hematocrit is 40 percent, it means that the plasma volume is 60 percent. So we know that the plasma volume is equal to 60 percent in this person of the blood volume. So let us say the blood volume is x. So we will have 60 percent of x is equal to 3600 ml. What is x? So x is equal to 3600 into 100 divided by 60 which is exactly what we have found here 3600 divided by 60. So you will get 3000 uh, you will get um, 6000 ml. So these are two ways of solving the same problem, one using the relationship between blood volume and plasma volume and the other which is a little more intuitive way of doing it. This problem describes a situation where 150 milligrams of sucrose is injected into a man whose weight is 70 kilos. The plasma sucrose level after sampling is 0 0.01 milligrams per ml. And we are also told that 10 milligrams has been excreted or metabolized during the mixing period. We are asked to calculate the ECF volume. So in this problem, we have been given that 150 milligrams of sucrose has been injected. Out of this 150 milligrams of sucrose that has been injected, 10 milligrams has been excreted or metabolized. And finally, after equilibrium or after adequate mixing, the plasma level when sampled was found to, ha to have 0 0.01 milligrams per ml of sucrose. And we are asked to calculate the ECF volume. Now let us begin solving this. We know that 150 milligrams was injected and we know that 10 milligrams was metabolized or excreted. So the amount that was finally distributed is 150 minus 10 or 
140 milligrams was distributed. So this is our mass that was distributed, 140 milligrams has been distributed. Now this 140 milligrams which is our mass is equal to the concentration into the volume of distribution. Now we know that 140 grams is equal to, sorry this is actually 140 milligrams, 140 milligrams is equal to 0 0.01 into V or V is equal to 140 divided by milligrams divided by 0 0.01 that is equal to 14,000 ml or 14 liters. So the volume of distribution of sucrose is 14 liters. Now we know that sucrose itself distributes into the ECF space. So we know that the ECF volume is equal to 14 liters. Now this question could be asked in a different way. You could be given a substance X and saying 150 milligrams of this substance X was given. Finally this was distributed and the volume was found to be 0 0.01 milligrams. In which compartment has this uh, substance X been distributed? And finally when you get 14 liters, we are assuming that this man, oh it's already given that this man is 70 kg. So 14 liters out of 70 kg will be 14 by 70 that is equal to 20 percent. So we know that the ECF volume is 20 percent of body weight. We know that the uh, ICF volume is 40 percent of body weight. So if this substance X gets distributed in a volume that is 20 percent of body weight, it is most likely a substance that gets distributed into the ECF compartment. So in this problem, we have the ECF volume finally in which sucrose gets distributed is 14 liters. This problem asks us that in a healthy adult male weighing 70 kilos, the total body water was measured to be 42 liters. What is his lean body mass? What is his fat mass? So in this problem, we are given that we have a 70 kg adult and the total body water is 42 liters. We are asked to calculate what is lean body mass and what is his fat mass. Now we know that the total body water is approximately equal to 60 percent of body mass and we know that it is 70 percent of lean body mass. So let the le so we know that 42 liters is equal to 70 percent of lean body mass. So lean body mass into 70 by 100 is equal to 42 liters. So lean body mass is equal to 42 into 100 divided by 70 that is equal to 60 kg. So this 70 kg adult has 60 kg which is his lean body mass or his mass without fat. Therefore his fat mass is equal to his body mass minus that is 70 kg minus his lean body mass that is 60 kg that is equal to 10 kg. So this 70 kg adult has 42 liters of water. He also has 60 kg which is fat free mass or lean body mass and he has 10 kg of fat which is his fat mass. So in summary we have discussed the various body fluid compartments. We have talked about the composition of these different body fluids the ICF and the ECF and we have also looked at ways in which 
the different body fluid compartments can be measured. Thank you.